All right, what's going on, my brothers and sisters? This is your brother, Greg Ward, coming straight from the heart of the Common Law Rights Society. And we're continuing on with our reading of um, Weiss's Concise Trustee Handbook. This is the 2008 version. And uh, you should be able to find the link in the description below. <clears throat> I believe this is part four. So we're going to talk be talking about authorized representatives today. You could uh, open up the file in the link below and read along. Um, I believe, let's see if this tells me the page. I'm on page 18 of 79 in the PDF. And uh, as far as if you print out the book, uh, is there a give page numbers? It's page 16. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, authorized representatives. As shown above, it is well within the power, discretion, and oftentimes duty to contract an authorized representative, managing agent, or attorney, in fact, to deal with certain affairs of the trust. And the basic rule which courts of equity have laid down is that a trustee may contract such agents to handle all affairs which require no discretion, be they ministerial or not, and he may not delegate the essential part of a power um, of course, he is permitted, unless, of course, he is permitted to do so by the trust instrument. Um, so, I'm going to read that again just so uh, we can get the concept uh, wrapped around, our brains wrapped around the concept. And I want to think about uh, something right now uh, in regards to our society. But let's read that again. So, um, as shown above, it is well within the power, discretion, and oftentimes duty to contract and author authorized representative, a managing agent or attorney, in fact, to deal with certain affairs of the trust. So let's stop there and let's look at um, our society and think in terms of the agencies that the federal government has created. If the federal government is a trust uh, in of sorts, uh, the state governments, uh, the uh, constitutions are trusts, then uh, certainly um, they've created agencies to handle certain delegated powers that they're delegating so we've given them delegated powers and they're delegating re-delegating those powers out to agents to re authorize representatives um, and let's continue on with the reading right here it says and the basic rule which courts of equity have laid down is that a trustee may that, that they're allowed to contract such agents to handle all all affairs which require no discretion be they ministerial or not. So let's again look over the sentence, and it says, and the basic rule which the courts of equity, who handle trust law, have laid down is that a trustee may, they're allowed to contract agents to handle all affairs which require no discretion. So now I'm going to look again at the agencies that the uh, federal government um, has appointed to handle certain affairs such as the uh, currency issuance, and I say, does something like that require no discretion, or would it require absolute discretion? Um, and I believe, I, I, it's been so long since I've read this case, but there's a case, oh, it's just on the tip of my tongue, um, from early 1900s, I believe, and it spoke about the fact that uh, government cannot delegate certain primary duties to uh, outside uh, agencies and third parties. So we'll, we'll revisit that another time, but it's something to think about. So as yourself being a trustee um, of your own trust, though, it's something different. You have the absolute right to contract agents and authorized representatives to deal with your trust business and deal with stuff such as accountants and um, whatever it may be, whatever you need uh third parties to do for you on behalf of the trust, you are absolutely 100% in your lawful right to uh, hire them. Let's continue on. In clarifying the discretionary power rule, it must be noted that there is a... I'm not sure why this is getting cut off. Uh, oh, there we go. Um, all right. In clarifying the discretionary power rule, it must be noted that there is no law against delegating discretionary powers to agents. Um... So I don't, that's interesting. Uh, so he's clarifying that, that although uh, it says above that they may not delegate the essential part of a power unless it's permitted by the trust instrument, then down below it says in clarifying the discretionary power rule, 
It must be noted that there is no law against delegating discretionary powers to agents. The rule is simply that a trustee who does so, does so at his own peril, for he is liable for all losses generated by the agent, if any. Um, so, yes, yeah, so the, the, the trustees, the fiduciaries, uh, so you being a trustee or fiduciary of your own trust, Despite the fact you might limit your liability by writing certain signatures in certain ways, um, if you out, act outside of the scope of your um, delegated powers or you cause harm to the beneficiaries through some kind of uh, bad faith act, then your protections as trustee go away, just like the sovereign immunities of the public officials go away when they out, act outside the scope of their jurisdiction. Uh, let us continue. Um, to clarify what constitutes the essential and the unessential parts of a power, the essential part is defined as the exercise of discretion, the determining of needs of the trust or the appropriateness of an action. The unessential part is that not requiring the exercise of discretion, etc., etc. However, there is a simple solution allowing for greater flexibility in this rule. The solution is to authorize the agent to contract on behalf of the trust, subject to the assent of the trustee. So the, uh, the agent can contract uh, as long as the trustee assents to that. Um, and as noted in the previous section, if the trust instrument makes provisions for the contracting of an authorized representative, then the trustee cannot be liable for his acts. Interesting. Um, so as a trustee, you have the ability to create the trust indenture in such a way that allows you great latitude and flexibility to administer the needs uh, of the trust through your obligations and duties, whatever they might be, uh, travel, uh, purchase, rent, lease, uh, and at the same time you can hire outside agents to contract on behalf of the trust and you would not be liable for those actions. Again, I would assume if they were blatant disregard for uh, the common law wrongs and trespasses, then that agent would be held liable in his private capacity, just the same as anybody else. Uh, when they talk about piercing the corporate veil, the same type of thing happens with the trustee if they act outside of the scope of responsible action. Let's continue on. Uh, and that's, let me just say, say as a side note, that's why it's important to consider Creating a trust that's simple, simple, simple for one part of your uh, facet of existence that you never would violate. Uh, that That is very simple, right? And so then you could also have another trust for asset protection if you feel the need to do so. Again, none of this is legal advice. Please do your own due diligence. All right, let's continue on. Now, the method for con contracting such agents may be f either by, form by formal appointment if mandated by the trust instrument, or by execution of a limited power of attorney, letter of authorization, or even certificate of verbal authorization documented by minutes of meeting. The most effective, secure method of contracting such an agent would obviously be an actual appointment with written contract setting forth the specifics of the position, but a letter of introduction is, for the most purposes, sufficient, as is a simple power of attorney when the agent is acting specifically under the title of attorney in fact. Uh, next section, express trust versus corporation. Um, first, I must clarify, though I am referring primarily to corporations, included in the reference are all organizations which owe their existence to legislative acts not limited to limited liability companies, limited partnerships, agencies, associations, etc., Though not classified as corporations, they avail themselves of benefits, privileges, and franchises of the state for, for their very creation and existence. Second, since we have already shown the distinct juridical personality of the trust as a legal entity, and it goes, says to go down to number 102, uh, C. Brigham versus U.S., versus U.S., um, and Burnett versus Smith, so go check those back out when he's referring to the fact that the trust has its own distinct juridical personality. Uh, let's see, where are we? Since we will not re-examine it 
until we consider its personality under the Roman civil law of the 14th Amendment in a later section. But it must be noted the well-settled law that the express trust is a lawful, legal, valid business organization with the right to hold property and sue in its business name, and its uses in modern business have some of their strongest roots in, in England, Germany, and many of the United States, where it has been recognized for its superiority and even praised by such notable authorities as the Ohio Supreme Court for its effectiveness in the business of life insurance. The Declaration of Trust has been held to be an effective substitute for incorporation for its many advantages, which will undoubtedly shine through to the reader by the following table. I have prepared this table based upon the work by John H. Sears, who after, who after discussing the impact of the twin landmark cases down below in 107, Elliott v. Freeman, and Maine Baptist Missionary Convention v. Cotting. Go check those out, and definitely go check out the book by John H. Sears, which is actually called um, ba 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 ba. Um, where is this? I can't remember it. Let's see if it gives it down below. Anyway, it's basically it's called Trust as Effective Substitutions for Incorporation. Um, all right, let's continue. Um, after discussing the impact of the twin landmark cases on the grave lack of profitability of using corporations for inter alia dealing in real estate, when to task in outlining the distinct benefits of express trusts. Um, yep, that was the end of the sentence. Um, let me read that again. I have prepared this table based upon the work by John H. Sears, who, after discussing the impact of the twin landmark cases on the grave lack of profitability of using corporations, dealing in real estate, went to task in outlining the distinct benefits of express trusts. All right. The works by William C. Dunn, which is Trust for Business Purposes, 1922. Uh, Guy A. Thompson, which is Business Trust as Substitute for Business Corporations. So maybe that was what I was thinking. And Sidney R. Wrightington, which is The Law of Unincorporated Associations and Business Trusts, Second Edition, 1923. Notice these are all pre- bankruptcy, and if you go find the Sears book, it's 1911, which is pre-Federal Reserve, um, are cited as well. Mr. Sears says, The decision of the United States Supreme Court, holding that the express trusts are not subject to the federal excise tax on corporations, has emphasized this method of conducting business as compared with corporations. The best legal talent was a soon impressed into the service of devising a means of affording the usual advantages belonging to a corporation without the authority of any legislative act. I'll read that again. The best legal talent was soon impressed into the service of devising a means of, afford of affording the usual advantages belonging to a corporation without the authority of any legislative act. A method of placing the property into the hands of trustees who held the legal title and issued certificates similar to shares of stock to the SESTIQ Trust, showing the interest owed by each possessed nearly all the advantages, advantages desired. This included the use of limited liability comp companies, joint stock associations, and co-partnerships, which are organized under enabling statutes, which merely enlarge the privileges possessed at the common law, and they are therefore subject to state regulations which may be equally burdensome to those imposed on corporations. Italics emphasize supplied and original, bold emphasis in brackets information added. All right. Express trusts governed, un governed under equity. Trust law is the most well-settled body of law in America. Corporations governed under statute, forever changing according to political agendas and schemes. Express trusts. Trustees are sole authority except where delegated to agents or a board of directors, corporations. Board of directors are managed are board of directors are managers with limited defined powers to conduct business, hold regular meetings, etc. Express trusts. Trustees 
afforded more leverage and powers are generally broader than corporate officers. Law provides that whatever any individual may do, the trust may do. The sky, nature, is the limit. Corporations. Relatively broad powers, such as with holding such as withholding companies, but corporations may not do whatever any individual may lawfully do. They can only do what is legal. The statute, legislature, is the limit. Let me read that again, you guys. Uh, although you might be hearing it under corporations, then think to the opposite of what a trust can do. Under corporation, relatively broad powers, such as with holding companies, or corporations may not do whatever any individual may lawfully do. They can only do what is legal. The statute, legislature, is the limit. So lawful and legal are two separate things. Lawful is not defined by statute. Statute limits and regulates uh, entities created by statute. Trustees under the express trust under the common law are, se are uh, state citizens, um, not 14th Amendment citizens. They have lawful, constitutionally protected rights not const not Fourteenth Amendment grant privileges. Uh, that's just my side note. Uh, okay, express trust. Trustees' liability is limited by trust instrument and by signature on all contracts and instruments. Remember Boyd and Silverthorne. Trustees not subject to subpoena. Corporations, corporate officers, corporate officers personally liable to legislature and to creditors for all ambiguous endorsements. Remember, Enron and Global Crossing cannot escape service of process. So, trustees not subject to subpoena. And 14th Amendment entities, remember, Enron and Global Crossing, they cannot escape service of process. I'm going to read where that comes from. Uh, footnote number 112. Although corporate officers reserve the relative right to plead the fifth, they have merely the relative right to plead. The congressionally interpreted spirit of the amendment, not the letter of the law, due to their 14th Amendment citizenship, trustees of an express trust have the absolute right to, dis to directly refuse self-incrimination as well as indirectly on a jurisdictional basis. See Lee Brops except, uh, et al. from above, which uh, I began a video on that same Lee Brops reference. I believe he's talking about... Um, USA the Republic, and then it says also see Boyd versus uh, U.S. and Silverthorne Lumber Lumber Company versus U.S. Um, and he goes on. Let's see. Uh, lifespan of a twenty. Okay, for Express Trusts, I'm gonna get go down in one line for Express Trust, and then go down one line for corporations. Express Trust lifespan of twenty to twenty five years at a time in order. To avoid rules against perpetuity, perpetuities, death of settler or trustee has no effect on life or affairs of trust. Succession is pow of power is quiet and private. Trust is not required to obtain business license. Trustees are not required to file reports with any entities and are accountable only to the beneficiary, governed strictly under principles of equity. Business name is naturally protected by injunctions may also use trade name or trademark for trust purposes without registration. Gosh, we, what is that, 114, see People versus Rose, and there's a whole bunch of others. All federal excise tax and state organization and franchise taxes are legally avoided. They are not subject to foreign corporation laws of any state, not inherently subject to, to commercial regulation, except for income derived from corporate stock and physical franchises under Article I, Section 8, Clauses 1 and 3. Express Trust is a valid legal entity in all states of the Union. Look at 116. See Farmers Loan and Trust uh, and a few others. For an, un for an understanding of the profound superiority of Article 4, Section 2, Citizenship over 14th Amendment, see Lee Brobst. I'll see if I could uh, pull it up again. Um... Trust may function as an Article 4, Section 2 citizen of the United States via its trustee, not a 14th Amendment citizen. This, this citizen is understood in constitutional law as the private citizen. See 118 down below. 
Um, 118, where are you? Hale versus Hankel. We've all read that. That's a very good uh, quote. I don't have it off the top of my head. Now we'll read corporations. Lifespan is perpetual or a certain number of years according to legislative requirements. All officer changes must be reported, which records are open for public review. The opposite of the is the case where they have to obtain business licenses. Uh, required to file statements and, re and reports quarterly, etc. Must apply for and secure a fictitious, fir fictitious firm name and must register all trade names opposite of a trustee. The opposite is the case except for sta state taxes in certain states. In either respect, all corporations are taxed indirectly via inflation. It says C-115. Inflation is a method of taxation which the government uses to secure the command over real resources, resources just as real as those obtained by ordinary taxation. What is raised by printing notes is just as much taken from the public as is an income tax. See the 1980 Annual Report, Federal Reserve Bank of Richmond, page 10, quoting John Maynard Keynes, The Economic Consequences of the Peace, 1920. Inherently subject to all foreign corporation laws and public policy regulation. Corporation is the 14th Amendment citizen, or is a 14th Amendment citizen, regardless of citizenship of corporate officer. Generally, state corporations uh, require officers to be citizens as well. The citizen is inherently public due to the nature of the amendment. 120. 14th Amendment citizens under the Roman Civil Law private international law, admiralty maritime law, are inherently public with only relative privacy. I'll read it again. 14th Amendment citizens under the Roman civil law, which is also called private international law or admiralty maritime law, are inherently public with only relative privacy. Oh, and he goes on. Trustees have absolute rights and privileges to get, engage in commerce under protection of the federal constitution, C-121, any statute enacted by a state which prohibits this right is in conflict with the constitution, C. Uh, Bruant v. Richardson, Roby v. Smith, and Farmers Loan and Trust Company. Um, trustees issue, issue certificates in the manner prescribed by trust instrument. Certificate holders have no say in the administration of trust affairs. The beneficiaries do not administer the trust. Interests of the beneficiaries, well protected by equity, power to secure information as to the actions of the trustees and trust affairs is no doubt superior to the rights and remedies of stockholders in corporations. Units of interest in the trust are not personal property of certificate holder and carry no liability as such. No legal obligation to maintain the capital and refrain from paying dividends out of capital. Trust instrument governs. So again, no legal obligation to maintain the capital or refrain or refrain, excuse me, refrain from paying dividends out of capital. Trust instrument governs. They may prosecute and defend litigation in trust or trustee name without compromising legality. Same rules as to parties and procedure at law and in equity are applicable. Now for corporations. Corporate officers have relative right and privileges to do so and incur more tax liability by doing so. Um, must go public in order to issue stock. Stockholders have a relative say in affairs depending on the extent of their holding. Stockholders' rights protected by courts. Yet the basic statutory nature of corporations allow for abuse. Stockholders are generally at the mercy of someone. Shares of stock are personal property in hands of owner, and taxes issue on same property against both owner and corporation. The opposite is the case of no, le no legal obligation to maintain the capital and refrain from paying dividends out of the capital. Trust instrument governs. The opposite, th the opposite is the case with corporations. Corporations may bring and defend litigation in the corporate name and entity only. The process of piercing corporate veils succeeds mostly due to confusion of personal and official capacity by officers. All right, we're about to stop here in a second. Uh, while the mortality rate of corporations and the like have historically remained high, expressed trusts remained 
and indeed to this day continue to remain vital. Also, as the table shows, many of the powers of the Express Trust are substantially the same as those of a corporation in effect, but without the legislative requirement of registration in order for those powers to be activated. These advantages and more have been and are still seized by some of the shrewdest, wealthiest individuals and families in America and from abroad, but the widely perceived yet untraceable wealth of such individuals and families like the Rothschilds, Rockefellers, Kennedys, Forbes, and many of the American founding fathers, plus countless modern-day politicians, are strong circumstantial evidence of this. One may find many articles and information, as well as quotes attesting to this. Lastly, it should be mentioned that unlike the corporation, there is no lawful method by which to pierce the trust without the express permission or implied consent of the trustee, or some unlawful activity on the part of the trust giving rise to a bona fide cause of action. As a result, virtually no direct evidence of the trust's existence can be found unless it is made to be found via recording. Even then, it can only be heard by a court of competent jurisdiction, when, as you shall see in the, sec- in the sections ahead, is very hard to find nowadays. This is protection at its finest, hiding in plain sight, for as the maxim goes, bene vixit qui bene latut, which means, he lives well who conceals himself and his assets well. 43 B.C. A.D. A.D. I don't know. A.D. 18. Not sure. But, uh, yeah, you guys, we're going to uh, stop there and continue on with understanding commerce in our next video. All right. I hope you guys are having a great day and stay positive. And we'll talk to you soon. One love.